I've focused a lot of my work right now on incarcerated and returning citizens. I got very excited when I heard about a model in Puerto Rico where incarcerated um, workers own their own co-ops. And I've been trying to bring that to the United States. It's a really slow process, um, partly because I don't have any funding. It's also partly because the U.S. is so archaic. So even though Puerto Rico is in officially in the U.S., this is through state, basically state laws that they can enact as a commonwealth partner. Um, so bringing that to the U.S. has been really difficult. But the notion there is to look and see how incarcerated people can make life a little bit better behind bars, which is now like the worst place to be, right? Um, how you can create a business, own it with your fellow inmates, uh, use it to humanize your life a little bit, as well as to connect back with your family, because now you can make an income that you can share with your family, as well as work with other people and use your energy and um, uh, and social capital uh, to help build something and build it with other people in your same situation and help everybody's family, that kind of thing. The specifics, I guess, I'm assuming everyone knows some of that work already that I've done, but I'll tell you the specifics. There's one co-op, the oldest one um, in Puerto Rico. Uh, it's about 12, 13 years old now. Uh, Cooperative Aragos. It's an artist cooperative. Uh, inside, uh, I always forget the name of the prison, outside of San Juan, a male, medium uh, security male prison. And what they were able to do was to create a worker co-op, to create their art and sell it. They've had a huge amount of support from uh, the League of Cooperatives, the Puerto Rican League of Cooperatives and the other co-ops in Puerto Rico. So that they, the, the league sent them a co-op educator. Actually, they demanded a co-op educator when they realized they wanted to become a co-op, not just a, a for-profit business. Um, the league has sent them a co-op educator. Uh, they were able to have a meeting with the governor at the time. This was 14 years ago because they realized that the co-op laws in Puerto Rico, and I think they're pretty much the same in the U.S., don't allow you to be an owner or on the board of a co-op if you're incarcerated. So they actually met with the governor who agreed with them that the law should be changed and got them involved with the state assembly and the state assembly eventually changed the law so that they could be incarcerated and own their own co-op. They didn't want outsiders to own the co-op and employ them. They wanted to own their own co-op and run it themselves. And so that's what they were able to do. They won the law change so that they could then do that. So then they ran their own artist cooperative. They have laws and policies about if you're a parent, some of your earnings every year have to go back to your family. Um, they have agreements with the prison. 15% of their revenues have to go back to the prison because they rent space and computers from the prison in order to run their business. They also have another agreement with the prison to go out. The co-op community invites them to co-op AGMs, annual general meetings, and other co-op conferences to sell their work. And so they have an agreement that they pay all the expenses, take two guards with them, and send two of their people out there. They have process for how they pick who can be the face, their face out in the world and sell the work for them, that kind of thing. So it's a really well-honed process. Um, and they've been able to uh, do a lot, um, 50, at least 50 of the members have already gotten uh, their sentences diminished because of the good work they did as co-op members and have been gotten, gone out and been uh, are on parole or out of prison now. Um, recidivism rate, only two of them went back and one is already out again. So they have a really low recidivism rate. So all the issues that one could say could be a problem with doing this have pretty much don't exist in that example. Um, there's three others, three or four others that have been starting up in Puerto Rico similar. There's a women's, uh, in one of the women's prison. That one apparently has been really hard. Apparently they treat the women prisoners even worse than men in men prison. So that it's been much harder for them to get organized. They have. Uh, they had a business plan to have a bakery, and then the corrections office took that 
business plan and started a bakery themselves. So they had to start all over and they decided to do a sewing co-op and they got sewing machines donated. And then just as they were about to launch, half of their members got transferred to another prison. The woman they elected president got put in solitary. So it was hard for her to attend meetings. So they actually had to petition to get her two extra hours out of solitary a week so she could attend co-op meetings. So anyway, you see they, they have lots of problems. And every time a prison officer changes, or at least the higher ups change, they have to renegotiate all the MOUs and that kind of thing. But anyway, it's working. It's a great model. We've been talking about it here in the US for a while and we're still working. I've got a group that's working. We're working on the research, trying to figure out how to make this work, who would fund this kind of work, and then what state laws exist, need to be changed or exist that would allow this level of co-op development. So that's like really exciting. Um, what's happening even faster in the US though is co-ops for uh, returning citizens, worker co-ops returning citizens. There's a lot of groups, um, Maryland, LA, Massachusetts, that have already started working with returning citizens to create their own or to be part of a worker co-op. Um, and that looks really promising. There's a lot less hurdles, um, but there's still a lot, of, um, a lot of pieces to work out. Incarcerated citizens need a lot of support systems, so trying to figure out the relationship of a worker co-op to the support systems has been a challenge how fast does the worker co-op get uh, start up and get breaking even so it can really be giving living wages and really providing the kind of support and stability that's needed. All those questions we're still working on. Um, and then how to train, how to teach co-op economics to people. I'm trying to do it while they're still in prison. So when they come out, they're ready to jump into a co-op, but also while they're in prison, we might be able to figure out how they can own their own co-op. So the education piece is um, the part I was gonna end on, right? Yeah. So getting to that in a minute, but those are some of the hurdles for that. But there's actually a lot of good energy around thinking about this. I don't know if all of you know, but um, I think it was from Obama, there's been uh, changes in policies and a lot of people who got three strikes you're out and mandatory minimums in the 90s and 2000s are now coming out in the next few years. So a lot of people who work in this area realize they need to figure out something to do with returning citizens. So there's a growing interest in trying to figure this out um, and figure out where to go with that. Thank you.